Asdrubiel Vect is the biggest troll to ever walk the 40k universe. He is also a sick fuck. Asdrubiel Vect in all his bitch getting glory. Vect is the supreme lord of the Cabal of the Black Heart and the pimp master general of Kamorag. He spends most of his time plotting how to troll people. Basically, he does it for the lulz. He's also one really old son of a bitch. Apparently older than a fucking god. He gives Elrod penis envy. He also was a close combat monster on the tabletop, being one of the few characters who could reliably go toe to toe with a bad and the despoiler and win. Something he shared with Mephiston and the Swarm Lord. Entire armies suffered critical existence failure the moment he got within reach. I mean Jesus fucking Christ. This was prior to his removal though, and he has not had actual statistics for a while now. Despite being someone who would, conceivably, have done a lot in over 10,000 years, Fluff itself is rather sparse concerning Vect, except to mention him killing other Archons. Being one of the oldest pricks in history, predating even old Rabbit. As Drubiel Vect is bigger than a dick, he is a prick. He is constantly bringing things to an unprecedented level of dickishness allowing himself to steeple his fingers and cackle just as planned while simultaneously having his cock sucked by his twin blonde lesbian sex slaves. Yeah, he's just that much of a boss. In fact the only reason he managed to last this long is because no one has ever been able to out prick him. At least until of rain threw his rulership into question and escaped all his attempts at retribution. And, considering Kamorag is a place where rape is considered as exciting a pastime as eating a ham sandwich, that's fucking saying something. There have been numerous occasions where the various Archons of other Cabals have tried to assassinate him in order to gain lordship over all of Kamorag. So far Vect has managed to trump each of them in the most dickish ways possible. Just a small example he planned for the invasion of Kamorag by three space marine chapters in order to kill off all of the remaining old Elder Empire nobility in Kamorag ensuring he would be unopposed and unbeatable in the Dark City. Vect also disposed of one of his rivals, Arkenqu, by getting Qu's daughter to betray him. She was one of Vect's sexual conquests. Arkenqu was then flayed and his essence trapped in the flayed skin. Vect probably brings Qu's daughter down there so she can suck Vect off in front of her father and he can't do anything but watch. What a prick. He is unnerved by Phoenix Lords though, or perhaps a better term would be envious. When Jainzar met him to organize the release of a disgraced Arkan, it became painfully clear to the first of the Howling Banshees that Astrobiel in his own way envied what he saw as the genuine immortality of the Phoenix Lords. List of Astrobiel's greatest achievements. Captured a strike cruiser of the Salamanders in order to bait the Imperium into attacking Kamorag, and made sure to set things up so the fight drag out and lure his direct obstacles. The houses of the aristocracy, into fighting amongst themselves to claim this prize. The Imperial Navy and Salamander's strike force, including two more cruisers and a battle barge, that barged in afterwards. Took the captured ship back and killed the nobles before retreating from the Dark Elder's retaliation, ensuring Vect ruled unopposed. Whilst also demonstrating how incredibly powerful space marines are, just as planned. Crashed a space hulk full of demons into a fortress of the only Arkan who came to really threaten him, turning his entire realm into a demon infested hellhole tricked a dark elder lord of a webway realm who refused his rule into opening a gift from him with a black hole in it. Surprise. To elaborate on the daughter example above, Vect defeated Arkan Qu, lord of the Iron Thorn, by persuading Qu's daughter to betray him. Vect's cabal didn't have the military might to guarantee victory, so he got Qu's daughter to betray her father and deliver the realm into Vect's hands. What Qu didn't know was that his daughter had become one of Vect's courtesans long before. He also contributed part of his cabal to the Elder's joint effort from Iandon and Bealtan to stop High Fleet Leviathan from annexing a part of High Fleet Kraken and the Valida Supplement Gasp. A Warhammer 40k campaign that, for once, doesn't involve Space Marines. This happened because the Tyranids had somehow managed to enter the webway and to taunt the Elder of Iandon about their necromancy. Had his giant floating ziggurat show up in the middle of a witch cult arena game to fire at the stands and kill one of the spectators who had betrayed him. Incidentally killing all the captured Imperial Guardsmen who the Witches were supposed to fight forcing the show to be cancelled. When a whole bunch of Cabals rebelled against him, he faked his own death in the battle to see which of his forces would retreat to his headquarters and which would join the rebel army. Upon doing so, he unleashed the power of one of Kamorag's captive sons to completely annihilate the entire rebel army alongside every innocent bystander who lived in that part of the city. Dawn of War Soulstorm. Believe or not, Vect is one of those important figures in 40k that made an appearance in video game like Abaddon. However, 
No one seems to care because he was overshadowed by other hilariously bad things about this game. Even his own idiot apprentice Terrell made more appearance than he did. The only screen time the Big V gets is from taking his days out for a spin as the Dark Elder Relic unit of Glass Cannon do. He is also encountered in the Dark Elder Stronghold, where he ran away on his pimp ride full of hoes like a little bitch. Swore to rape Terrell for his failure but got his ride shot down by your troops Vect most likely didn't die, however. According to Terrell after seeing Vect crash, if he had died, I should have taken his place. Overall, the presentation for Vect in this game is rather disappointing. For the fact he never really made any awesome quote or any smart dickery like Sindri other than just chilling on his pimp mobile like a couch potato. You fool! I will have your head for this! Quickly, back to Kamara! Well, if he had died I should have taken his place. Now I must flee. Granted this is all formed before 5th edition's revamp, before that Vec had no trace or backstory other than the leader of the Dark Elder. Dark times ahead, due to Games Workshop not giving Vec a new model and ignoring his old one, as of the 7th edition Dark Elder Codex Astrubial Vec is no longer a playable character. Think of the implications, that'd be like cutting Marnius Kalga from the Ultramarines not that Games Workshop would ever do that, removing the Phoenix Lords from Craft World Elder or taking Gazgul out of Orkama books. For now, he exists only in the fluff which is thankfully unchanged. On a completely unrelated note, suck our balls GW. During the Gathering Storm campaign in which a Herald of Inad is born, Vect isn't happy about this in the slightest. Mostly because this triggers Kane's gates to shatter and demons to invade Kamorag. In the initial battle, Vect runs away like a bitch, pretty much in plain view of every important person in the city. Later on, he sends Yuri and Rakath and the Hemonkili to hunt down Ivrain, but they flee in terror after it is discovered that the Incarn can perma kill them. Vect then sends his cabal after her, but Ivrain has Harlequin's helper keep one step ahead of Vect. He insinuates to his court and servants that the disjunction was just as planned. But everyone knows that's BS though Vect is still feared enough that no one calls him out on his obvious lie. By the end of the story Vect has failed to contain the threat. Many of the Dark Elder including Lilith Hesperax leave to go join the Innery. His entire court is pissed at him. And several Archons are talking about leading an overthrow. With the loudest being Lady Males. Insult to injury, it is the Mandrakes, under Kiradru Ark, that finally managed to drive off the invading demons with help from the Hemonculi, completely upstaging Vect. Needless to say, he is extremely upset about all his plans going up in flames because of a meddling god. Things reached their peak when the unthinkable happened, Vect was murdered. He, in an uncharacteristic move, had sent his incubi bodyguards away to keep order. During this time Mandrakes, at the behest of an unknown employer, swarmed his inner sanctum and killed him. Some rumors said it was the cursed blade who ordered it, the witch cult had a reputation for treachery. Others said it was Lady Males, Lady Males had her cabal keep their distance from Vect and his forces despite her calling for his overthrow. The lore is ambiguous as to whether she had a hand in it. At the same moment every failsafe against death the Hemonculi had for Vect was destroyed. All the Archons across Kimorag were stunned. Some were dismayed, others worried in paranoia that if Vect himself could die how safe were they? All were apprehensive of the future of Kamorag and planned their next move. The Harlequins of the Veiled Path held a funeral for Vect at the Cursed Blades Arena, and Urian Rakath promised to openly show his newest creations. Many Archons and Cabals attended, either to gloat over Vect's death, out of loyalty or to see Urian Rakath's performance. But wait. At the height of Yuri and Rakath's performance, the Harlequins released hallucinogenic gas. They turned on all the Archons who attended, slaughtering them with the help of the cult of the Cursed Blade and Rakath's creations. The blood and suffering radiated, and Astrobiel Vect returned to life, rejuvenated by the suffering in the arena. Vect's first move was to have every Archon loyal to him that attended the funeral resurrected. Then he had some of the disloyal ones resurrected and turned into grotesques, or something like that. As Drubiel Vect was declared a living dark muse, he moved quickly and re-solidified his hold on Kamorag. He knew that Lilith had gone with the Innery, but he claimed that it was part of his plan and said he'd allow it for now. Strangely, though he took actions against everyone who was disloyal except Lady Males who kept a prudent distance between Vect and herself since before he died. He took no action against the Mandrakes that killed him, 
This suggests either that it was just as planned on his part, or that even Vec fears the mandrakes. It's also possible that he tried to make himself as a dark counterpart to Ibrain, an anti -inert. Whatever the case, Vect is back in control of Komorag and making plans, and first on his list is to destroy Ibrain. Too long didn't read Vect came back from the dead, and now everyone he hates better watch their backs. Arkan Terrell, the old bastard, slightly less retarded than Karen. Arkan Terrell is a raid commander serving Astrobiel Vect, heading up the forces of the Black Heart Cabal in the core of a system of Dawn of War Soulstorm. While he shares the same weakness of many characters in Soulstorm in that his personality isn't very fleshed out, he ironically is better characterized than most. If not all of the other commanders in the campaign, with the lone exception of Gorgut Zed Hunter, who carried over from Dark Crusade. He's especially notable for being one of, if not the only commander in the entire game to have a dialogue exchange with any of the enemy commanders, as he openly shit talks Farsia Kauris during her speeches about how her opponent isn't as graceful as the Elder is. Compared to the other characters in the campaign, Terrell is smug, arrogant, and sly. Canonically, he's someone who's old as balls, even by Dark Elder standards, has survived dozens of assassination and usurpation attempts, and is always prepared to get shit done. He didn't get to his position as Vect's head officer by being stupid, and anyone able to stay on Vect's payroll for any extended period of time is going to be either as masterful a prick or someone who's survived the periodic attempts at dicking with him. So you know he's not to be fucked with. Humorously, Tarrell only really considered two of the other commanders in the sector a threat Farseer Kairis, and Chaos Lord Faravius Karen. Kairis he particularly wanted as a personal plaything, and was concerned about the Farseer fucking up his plans. Karen he considered a threat less because of his intelligence, and more because Karen's entire army was at his fucking doorstep and had every intent of wrecking his shit. If he is successful, the core of her system as a whole is stripped heavily of life, the bulk of it, regardless of race, brought back to Kamorag for slaves and sport. Tarrell is well rewarded and retires to his private abode, presumably to celebrate with the harem of Dark Elder Skanks and a few captive sisters of battle. This is canonical ending, as in every other Vec dies. And come on, he's too big of a figure to die like that. With the last major threat removed, the Dark Eldar were now free to roam through the Calva system, pillaging and laying waste as they saw fit. Like gruesome locusts, the Blackheart Cabal darkened the skies with their vehicles, descending on territory after territory, laying claim to prisoners and other spoils. The speed and ravening hunger with which these raids were carried out was remarkable. Nothing could escape them. Nothing could outrun them. The keen senses of the Dark Eldar seemed to pierce all cover in search of their prey. It was not long before all Kaulava was stripped bare and devoid of life. Back on the moon of Lacune, Cages grew full of captives, and more cages were built. Archon Terrell and his master, Lord Vect, sat and supped goblets filled with the souls of her enemies. The homunculus Grumenael cackled gleefully over his victims. As the warp storm quietly disappeared, so too did the Dark Eldar vanish. Returned to the webway. To revel, then go in search of new, fresh worlds to pillage and enslave. Service. When Farseer Kairis brought her forces to stop the Coravan Necron Lord from bringing his tomb complex back online and threatening the region, she inadvertently paved the way for her own downfall. Kairis' heavy handed attempts to bring in additional forces activated a suite of other webway gates, which were quickly used by the other armies for interstellar travel during the conflict as the warp storm was preventing conventional interstellar travel. Unfortunately that much activity inevitably drew the attention of the Dark Elder, who viewed the system in conflict in much the same way a vulture looks at a battlefield. Quickly, the Dark Elder set up on Lacuni, the moon orbiting core of the 4, where a master gateway was set up. Using it, they could strike across the system with more or less impunity, killing and abducting as they saw fit, and bringing slaves and spoils back to the moon for transport home to Kimorag. To keep his forces vitalized and on task, Cabal Homunculus, Grumaniel, 
built in extensive torture grounds, where countless slaves could be tortured and muddied for entertainment, curiosity, and, of course, nourishment. With the ongoing chaos brewing across the system, the initial conflict went well, and the Dark Elder quickly gained ground. Terrell, obsessed with the chance to capture a Farseer for his own amusement, went after Karuz immediately, chasing the wily Farseer halfway across Korova 3, before overrunning her base in the upper wastes. Kairis was forced to flee, but countless Althwe Elder had been captured and dragged back to Kimorag. Continually attacked by Karen's Alpha Legion forces, the Dark Elder was soon forced into a defensive battle, which was not to their advantage. Aral ultimately pushed Karen back and in a series of raids, succeeded at striking the corner champion and his base at the peninsula of Isult. Though they were ultimately unable to drive Karen's forces from the system, it was this strike that would ultimately prove ruinous for the Dark Elder. It wasn't long at all before the Sisters of Battle came to Core of the Four to fight with the Chaos Forces. At first, Karen was relieved. The Sisters were too heavy handed to take notice of the Dark Elder, and with the two factions fighting one another, the Dark Elder would be free to resume their predations. Unfortunately, soon after, the forces of Vance Mathefa King Stubbs took one of the gates of Core of the Four, and soon after, eager for payback, launched an assault on Lacuni. Tarrell's forces, being more intended for raiding and having relied mostly on stealth to keep their base safe, were unprepared for the assault. The Imperial Guard freed what personnel they could, established a beachhead, and proceeded to lead a series of assaults directed at ripping the Dark Elder out of the region for good. As Drubiel Vect, seeing a chance to make an example of the upstart commander, climbed aboard his pimp mobile Ravager and led a series of coordinated assaults on the guard's outpost. Quickly, however, the guard set up additional defenses, and managed to catch Vex transport before it could escape, hammering it with heavy ordnance until the vehicle crashed. Vect escaped, barely, using a personal webway device, as the Lacuni outpost burned around them. Terrell, too, escaped through the gate, but doubtlessly would face punishment for failing Vec to this degree. Demotion, death, or torture were all possible for those who had failed the leader of Kamorag. And the only reason Vect would show mercy would be to drive home that Terrell owed the wily Dark Elder leader his life. Statistics. At a glance, Terrell looks like any other Dark Elder Arkan. High melee attack power, some good abilities, and remarkable defenses for a unit in this army. Unlike the base model, however, Terrell is substantially more durable and powerful. Not only does he get better weapon upgrades, and, indeed, benefits from others mid-fight like Poison Blades, he gains benefits that specifically boost his attached Inky by bodyguards, further increase his ferocious melee power, and didn't even give him what is basically a clone of the Warp Spider's Haywire Grenade. His melee damage is arguably the highest of any commander once his retina is factored in, making his team capable of cutting even the most brutal of forces to shreds, and his only weakness is that he doesn't detect, have moral resistance, or moral immunity. Tarrell can be further boosted by combat drugs from his witch buddies, though, which essentially double his damage output and make him and his team completely moral immune. Throw an upgraded Terrell at anything, use the corrosion soul power, and laugh as Terrell rips absolutely any enemy in the game to fucking pieces. Baron Sathanix. We'll meet again, Spider-Man. Baron Sathanix is an A-lead of the Dark Elder Hellions, known for being that damn good on a skyboard and Spider-Man's such nemesis. Originally, he was a high-ranking noble of the Cabal of the Slash Tie. Then he had the daring idea of bedding a Farseer. Due to his sheer badassery he actually pulled it off, bringing said Farseer to Kimorag. Everyone being either alarmist buzzkills who said that bringing sickers into Kimorag is bringing trouble one way or another, or jealous assholes who wanted a piece of that fine craft world ass or maybe even a mix of both, they rallied behind the Arkan of the Cabal of the Slash Tie, Sathanix's boss, and kicked Sathanix out of the Cabal and into the pit known as Kimorag's Ghetto. Joke was on those pricks, because he managed to break out of said pit and began living as a rebel. Even though the cabal that kicked him out put a bounty out on his head, it was full of idiots such as the incompetent dunce running it because they never managed to catch Sathanix. This led to the Baron building up his rebel army of Hellions and other Kamora Griffraff and then aiming it at said cabal, bringing it to his knees. What happened afterwards comes as utterly no surprise to anyone who is a Dark Elder. Afterwards, if you're curious, Sathanix allowed his old cabal to remain while he remained kingpin of all Dark Elder Hellion gangs. But the cabal answered to him and the new Arkan is just a puppet with Sathanix pulling the strings. Oh, and if you want to hear a special detail that Farseer he boned, she's dead. 
Whether or not this was the cabal's doing was never mentioned, but it probably wouldn't have changed much. Wanna know what the Baron did about this? Turn her crystal bones into new pimp coat accessories, which can predict the future when he drops them in a pool of blood, which is how he managed to avoid all his enemies and beat them. Damn, that's creepy, yet he's still only half as scary as Willem Dafoe, Drezha. He has lived for 10 millennia, seen 10 hundred battles, ended 10,000 lives, and given zero fucks. Drazza Dark Elder Speak for Living Sword, also known as Master of Blades, was first encountered at the gates of the Great Shrine of the Incubi in Kamorag. He walked straight into the shrine, cutting his way through any guards who tried to stop him. When he reached the Inner Sanctum, Drazza challenged the enthroned Hierarch of the shrine. The Hierarch stepped down from his throne into the dueling circle with Drazza and took up a battle stance. The Hierarch's self-assured superiority soon evaporated when his challenger blurred into action. The duel took only a couple of minutes until it ended with Drazza stepping over the Hierarch's dead body before making a small bow. No one knows Drazza's true identity. There are no records of him in any Incubus shrines and no one had heard of him before he walked into the Great Shrine. Even the name Drazza is ceremonial, meaning living sword. Even though he killed the Hierarch, and has since killed everyone bold enough to challenge him, he hasn't taken up any leadership post, not even becoming a lowly clavex. He could become Hierarch by right of conquest, or hold any position he wanted due to his skill, but he seems to totally lack ambition and exist only to kill. This frustrates the other shrine lords immensely, because they have no way of dealing with such a creature. After Draza had invaded the great shrine and killed its Hierarch, gossip and rumors started to spread. Some say Draza is the fallen phoenix lord, aha, uh -huh, and that Draza's armor is filled with nothing but bone dust. We can't say for sure about the armor, since he's never once taken it off not even to eat or sleep, but he certainly does have the same stat line as the other phoenix lords. And the Incubi are in many ways a dark reflection of the elder aspect warriors. Taller and more live than other Incubi, Draza is fast as lightning. Dark elder warriors move at a blur when viewed by humans. Incubi strike even faster. Draza moves so quickly that it leaves other Incubi wondering what the hell just happened. He wears an ancient Incubus warsuit, perhaps even the original warsuit, which is significantly tougher than those worn by others of the sect. Draza uses Demiclaves, formerly known as Decemboa Blades, which can also be used by deadly Clavex Incubi leaders. Tabletop. With 8th edition, his stat line is basically the same, but with how powerful claves are, he is a hell of a lot stronger. Not only that, he also buffs nearby Incubi, though this is useless once you hit turn 3 with the power from pain basically doing what Dreza's buff does. He generates extra attacks on wound rolls of a 6 but doesn't have the lethal precision Clavex ability for some bizarre reason. Many Incubi and a sizable portion of Kamorag's citizens were already dead after learning about this. Duke Sliscus, the closest you'll ever get to a decent image of a Dark Elder who isn't Vector Lilith, yet, yeah, he's kinda weird like that. The Duke of Pirates, Trevelyan Sliscus better known as the Duke or Sliscus the Serpent is the Dark Elder answer to Prince Serial as top space pirates. Acting as the poster boy for exiled Dark Elder who want to do what they want cause a pirate is free a popular theory is that he is Ariel's father. Given the mystery as to how the I and craft where older was conceived, he is as talented as a Shakespearean wordsmith, carving epic poetry into his prisoners bodies after injecting them with a buttload of poisons. He is also essentially David Bowie circa 1977. This is how Lady Mails describes the Duke Amoral, despicable and impeccably dressed into the bargain. When other Dark Elders say that about you, you know you have some serious style. The closest you'll ever get to a decent image of a Dark Elder who isn't Vector Lilith. See, Sliscus was originally just some pencil pushing something or other within Kamorag. However, he decided that boring shit sucked and stole three ships from Port Carmine and began his personal Corsair Warband, the Sky Serpents. And so he's stuck around for a few thousand years, looting and pillaging all over the galaxy, whilst the Inquisition sat slack-jawed wondering where their ships went. He became the greatest pirate that ever plied the Sea of Stars. Which must be a testament to his skill as the commander of a legion of backstabbing bastards in his megalomaniacal vision to take over the galaxy behind a certain armless failure. A rotting psychic vegetable heresy. And the tomb kings and space. Not like that didn't affect his sanity, though. The guys got serious mood swings which managed to have some hilarious effects that he might have learned from the legendary Asholotep. For example, he decided to parley with some planetary government, and then decided to butcher all of the hive nobility because their envoy mispronounced his name. Like an asshole. 
Also, to add to his megalomania, he is pretty paranoid which makes him ironically perfectly rational for a citizen of Kamorag, feeding himself various poisons to build up his immune system. He also has a thing for wearing different clothes every single day to the point that he'd never wear the same set twice, and every outfit he wears includes body parts of most recent person he killed. Apparently his banner is also made from the flayed skin of the Lord Admiral of Segmentum Tempesta Segmentum Fortress. Sliscus has also been said to be amused by being called a serpent. He considers himself more dangerous than any animal and thinks that serpents should be renamed Sliscus after him instead of the other way around. Sliscus is also a Warhammer 40k drug lord. He has access to all the best combat drugs and poisons, which are reflected in his rules, which buff himself and the army. He's also the second most pimping Dark Elder after Astrubial Vect. In the 5th edition Dark Elder, he has his skin scrubbed thoroughly by teams of concubines every time he shares breathing space with a lesser species. And there are two reasons he's implied to be very popular with the ladies of the witch cults and only one of them is his drugs. So not only does he kill your army, he sweeps your girl off your feet and shows her a better time than you ever gave her. The duke's most well known engagement was against the space wolves, when he organized a raid on Fenris. Inevitably he was forced to quit the planet, after Lucas the trickster bested Lady Males and had her led him to the duke's camp. As the marine pursued the duke, Sliscus did manage a rare featuring for any Xenos, defeating a space marine in combat, and cut out one of Lucas Hearts the only other Xenos who have done this in lore are named characters such as Lilith, Imitech, Obiron and the Swarm Lord. Before he could finish slaying Lucas, however, he spat acid in the duke's face and escaped. Despite being awesome and a fan favorite, Games Workshop decided to cut the duke from the new edition of the Codex, much to the disappointment of Dark Elder fans. R.I.P. Duke. Kilrad Ruark. He even looks like a scumbag, with his scuzzy top knot and beach pants made of skin. He should really just stay in his freaky skull chamber and, like, eat all the shit. Kilrad Ruark the Decapitator is a Dark Elder special character Mandrake, and just a creepy fucking asshole. Kilrad Ruark isn't his real name, but a title that means he who hunts heads or Decapitator in the evil dialect of Elderese. Meaning that Kilrad Ruark the Decapitator translates to he who hunts heads and cuts them off. He has eyes of pure darkness and appears to be half shadow. All mandrakes are rumored to be the descendants of true elder and some kind of quasi-demonic beings that live in the space between the warp and the materium. He also paid a homunculus to attach a second pair of arms to him just to look more like a cross between a meth head and a trapdoor spider. Or maybe so he can jerk off while murdering people. Just, fuck, I don't even like looking at him. Kurad Ruark doesn't speak, he simply giggles like the creepy fuck he is. Like the other two Dark Elder HQ choices who barely communicate Lilith Hesperax and Drazza. He probably puts the various warriors and witches under their command in a tight spot when they need orders. But unlike Lilith and Drazza, who can at least lead by badass example and Lilith does speak, it's just most of the time she chooses not to kill Radruak wanders off on his own. Going Marbo by teleporting in through fucking shadows because he is goddamn magic level 4 wizard lore of shadow. His MO is then going to cut off a particular target's head, and just leaves the same way he came in. Which is a fucking area that simply doesn't have light bouncing off of it at the moment. He doesn't even go through the warp or some in-universe plausible thing like that. He's just one of those slasher film villains that seems to teleport between jump cuts. So he just chops a head off and pisses off, leaving all the Kabbalite warriors leaderless and all the witches shivering and ready to take a shower. In the game rules, he's so solitary that he lacks independent character and can't even join a unit of other mandrakes. Ugh. Christ. Fuck this guy. He stopped dressing like an SM demon and somehow got freakier looking. He gets paid an Arkans ransom to do this old law put it at the price of 200,000 souls for him to kill one guy of his pair's choosing. Even his fee is ridiculous. Even though I'm not quite sure how people get a hold of him. Does he have an agent? A LinkedIn profile? No, he can't. Because he doesn't fucking talk and Kamorag still uses anger. The only explanation is that he's always watching you. From any and every shadow. The worst thing is, he collects the heads he takes and brings them back to his lair like they're beanie babies. He flays them with his bare hands, and examines them, with his tongue, while almost certainly not washing his hands afterwards. And he's really fucking anal about it, like one of those people who can't bear to see a single smudge on the mint condition packaging of their yak face action figure. He throws away all but one in a decade of killing, and puts that lucky son of a bitch on display in a little cubby hole. Despite his incredibly high standards, 
His enormous chamber is almost full, making him a cross between a trading card collector, a trapdoor spider, and a fucking holocaust. And all these skulls are staring at a single point in the center of his lair. And holy shit, that psychic pressure is boring a hole straight through the reality of Kimorak into some realm of primal darkness. And remember, the dark city is already in nowhere land. Halfway between reality and hyperspace hell. His disciples believe that when whatever is done there breaks through everyone but his children followers, the mandrakes. RSOL everyone in Kamorak will drown in a tide of crazy warlock shit out of fucking nowhere, and then possibly beyond Kamorag. But man, really people, Kuradruak is just the worst. Fuck that guy. As of the 2014 Codex Kuradruak is no longer a playable unit. In addition, his fluff was downgraded to a single paragraph as a legendary mandrake. Hooray. However, the asshole has returned. That's right, as of Gathering Storm, Part 2, he managed to obtain the last skull he needed that of Vex Enforcer, and Phil Kelly O.C. Velosh and Sithric to open a way into the Mandrake's dimension and spread the Shadow Realm across dozens of miles of Kamorag, becoming the Mandrake King. With his Shadow Army, he sealed off the breach in Kane's Gate, preventing a load of demons from flooding into Kamorag. Whether this is a good thing is yet to be seen. Kilradruak also played a minor role in the Great Crusade. It turned out that he and his Mandrakes had been the Elder preying on Nocturne and he and Vulcan in particular had a grudge stemming from Vulcan being the only quarry to ever escape Kilradruak. Since all Xenos need some human to lose to, they would clash again briefly when Vulcan returned to Elanrach seeking a way to Terra, where Kilradruak took some shots at Vulcan till the Primarch made a bright light and struck the King of Mandrakes once, sending him fleeing for his life. Lady Males. You only wish your Arkan is as hot as her. This model was converted very well from the old Isabella Von Karstein. As much we like it to be there is no canon model or image. Amongst the Dark Elder, there is one that reigns supreme. Astrobiel Vect, Lord of the Cabal of the Black Heart. He is the most cunning Dark Elder to have lived and takes pleasure in reducing would-be usurpers to warp Hound Chow. Once chief amongst his underlings was the Lady Aurelia Males, who was his consort and displayed remarkable intelligence. For a while she was one of the prominent members of his inner circle and displayed her talents during the Panacea War C section below. Vect grew bored of her after a couple of centuries and maybe partially out of fear of her ambition and kicked Males out of her court. A woman scorned. Males and her followers left Kamorag into another expanse of the webway to get her hell no halfing fury on. There in the depths of the webway she met Segarach, who banished her followers and challenged Males to a game of wills, the loser of which would give their heart to the winner. Males was victorious and the glowing being vanished, leaving a blade and its crystal heart. Then, in a turn of events that was completely sensible, she used the blade to remove her own heart and place the crystal one inside herself. Because, you know, crystal works just as well as flesh with blood. We're talking about the unrelentingly weird world of 40k here. She could have stuck a muffin in there and it probably would have worked. From there she returned to Kamorag with revenge in mind against Vect and began to build up her power. Until she became the Arcan of the Cabal of the Poison Tongue and one of the most powerful rulers in the Dark City. Her keen mind is truly a Byzantine labyrinth, hatching countless plots and always preparing to take advantage of a situation. She is described as polite, aloft and haughty, which only matches the image we have of her as one of those Victorian English ladies or anime noblewoman villainesses with an annoying laugh hidden behind a razor fan. Unflattering polite while she plans how best to serve your brains on a platter at the next dinner party. She has matched wits with Astrobiel countless times and has an incredible sense of precognition. She may indeed in time be the one to finally dethrone Vect himself. Though as she has easily been outwitted by Lucas the Trickster before, this is very unlikely. Or, considering it's Astrobiel, very likely. Lady Males took part in a raid on Fenris, seeking to convince Duke Sliskus to assist her in overthrowing Vect but, instead, was cornered, defeated and blackmailed in short order by the Space Wolves, and was key to their successful destruction of the Dark Elder raiding camp. Although her competence remains in question, her classiness does not. No seriously, she has a razor-bladed fan. Classy as shit, the posh spice to Lilith Hesperax's sporty spice. Oh and it is claimed in rumors that she can often be heard laughing hysterically from her private quarters. Strange glowing being found in the webway that didn't try to nom nom an elder hysterical laughter powers of precognition yet. This has Segarach written all over it. The release of Codex Holoquims confirms it, the Veiled Path takes credit for the encounter, though it is vague as to why. He Panacea Incident. Males was desperate to become the first female member of the League of Extraordinary Dickery. At the time, 
Membership included the Emperor, Siege, the Deceiver, Segarach, Vect who is most likely trying to oppose Mill's membership, and Eldred. Her admission entry into the League was her actions during the Panacea Wars. Vect, desiring to weaken the lesser cabals, gave them the challenge to poison the entire Imperium. Males, discovering that the Imperium had recovered a precious STC, knew this was the perfect chance. She made it so that a large fleet of Orc Rooks crash landed into the Imperial Forge world where the STC had been found and while both sides were butchering each other Males and her bodyguard waltzed in and plucked the STC off a dead Orc mech boy's hands with a flourish and a kiss. Vect was highly pleased with this textbook example of evil and after that males enjoyed increased influence in the dark city. Why did stealing this particular artifact qualify? The STC, called the panacea which could basically cure every disease, ever, was one that could have saved countless billions of human lives through miraculous medical technologies and seriously given Nurgle a run for his money. Males knew fully well what the STC could have done but she keeps it locked away in her private gallery. A potent discovery that will forever be kept out of the Imperial's hands and which gives males enormous satisfaction, knowing she is causing lots of suffering. The League is currently assessing such an entry for full membership. Oh and to weaken some other orcs she was fighting another time. She developed a powerful chemical agent that works on their reproductive cycle and let it loose through a couple of orc-held planets. Again, this was done for giggles. Also, the fluff mentioned it was with help from the Lahamarians an all-female sect of dark elder courtesans poison experts in her entourage, implying that males is bisexual since these ladies are renowned for being high class, nobility exclusive prostitutes. The 7e homunculus coven supplement, while having males removed from play like most other named characters, does at least mention this spectacular tool as a new artifact for the homunculi. Apparently, one of the flesh makers found out males had this tool and instantly lusted for it like a tech priest. While she didn't let him have it, the guy was still more than willing to reverse engineer it so that it could be useful. What resulted was the Panacea Perverted, a tool that gives a massive boost to I wound as well as forcing all poisoned weapons to wound on a 6. That latter bit comes extremely useful for other Dark Elder, Nids, or Nurgle, who get all the poisoned stuff. Current status. Like everything else without a model, Males is no longer playable on the tabletop. In spite of this or possibly because of this, if you consider GW's possible fluff reasoning for making Vec not playable either. Her fluff role has expanded and she's now basically Vec's to staff counterpart. Kamorag has entered its own end times of a sort as she and Vec fight an internal, out and out street war in the city over a warp gate that threatens to break. Neither of them wanting it to open but mistakenly believing the other one does. Why any Dark Elder would try to unplug the cork in the anus of Kamorag remains a mystery. During the events of the Gathering Storm, and the Great Disjunction which threatened to destroy Kamorag, Lady Males took advantage of the demon invasion to rally more factions to her side, laying the blame for the invasion on Astrobiel, particularly on his inability to contain or manage the threat. Although the invasion was ultimately dealt with thanks to the Mandrakes and Hemonculi, Males possessed position has increased in strength, particularly as a result of Astrubial's own faltering support base. Interestingly males had been a patron of Ivrain, indicating that perhaps the Harlequins required, or do still require, something from males with regards to the opener of the seventh way. Despite her calls for Vec to be overthrown, when Astrobial Vec was murdered by Mandrakes, Males and her cabal went to ground rather than celebrate or make a move to claim power. She figured that his allies would come after her no matter what, but whether she actually had anything to do with Vect's death was anyone's guess. Neither will she present at Vect's wake, where the other Archons were killed and Vect was resurrected. For the time being, Males decided to keep their distance and watch, with the only person her cabal who knew her plans being Males herself. Lilith Hesperax. You can be the king, but watch the queen conquer. She'll conquer you so good. Her Excellence Lilith Hesperax is a Dark Elder special character, the leader of the Witch Cult of Strife and the most renowned succubus or witch champion in Kamorag. She is easily one of the biggest badasses in a universe of badasses. Simply because she has survived the arenas for millennia, she was already a powerful succubus when Astrobiel Vect began his rise to power, and in fact aided him in his coup. While there are thousands of warriors who carved bloody swaths across the galaxy, she's the only one who does it without modifications, the blessing of gods, super special weapons, or a wearable tank. She's armed only with two daggers, her hair, a sports bra, and a thong. Not even shoes? Not even shoes. 
And we're not kidding about her hair, she's so skilled at twisting around the hooks woven into it that it counts as a shardnet and impaler and as an app 2 power weapon well, used to. Now she can just ignore any armor save. Yes, she's so good at whipping her hair back and forth and using tiny ass daggers to find weak points that her attacks cut through terminator armor when a goddamn actual power sword won't. She is also listed as having plasma grenades, but since she isn't modeled with them, we must assume this is simply a way of granting distracting rules to that ass. History. Of particular note among her exploits is a story where she decided to give a special reward to whoever can give her the greatest opponent to fight. Having grown bored of cutting the same shit over and over. Predictably, every Arkan from here to hell jumped on the bandwagon and began optimistically hunting down the best of enemies to fight, and many of them failed. Lilith slaughtered her way through captured hive tyrants, elder autarchs and orc warbuses. However, one lucky Arkan did finally bring out one particular space marine champion. In a display of space marine ego stroking in the dark elder codex, the battle lasted for several hours, and before the marine died, he managed to give Lilith a nasty scar across her midriff. Of course, such a besmirching mark pissed her off to no end and when the Arkan who brought the marine asked for a reward, she merely tossed him the space marine's sword and mentioned that the reward was to die by her blades the Arkan only lasted 6 minutes against her. Just goes to show you to not fuck with a woman's image. Lilith also once got royally fucked over by the Legion of the Damned, during the Battle of Thersus. Which was all just a way of drawing the Black Templar High Marshal Helbrecht into a trap in order to capture him and throw him into the arenas. Lilith started beating his ass as she always does but just before she could bag him, the Legion showed up and started murdering anything not in power armor. Somehow, their bodies were immaterial, and Lilith could find no purchase on them, yet their bullets certainly weren't. She was forced to retreat in the face of this ghostly onslaught. No word on how she's coping, most likely just chalked it up to her loss and killed a few gladiators in the crucible as stress relief. There is also a story about how once, an Alpha Legion Chaos Lord by the name of Jagathra of Vrax managed to really piss off Vect himself he attacked at a raiding party in the middle of their fun, depriving Kamorag and Astrobiel himself of a few million hard earned orgasms. In return, Vect launched an attack on Vrax's stronghold. Lilith was ordered to participate personally, and fought Vrax himself, promising him and the rest of the CSM life and freedom if he beat her. She disarmed him with the first flurry, a literal disarming. That is, the sword was still in Vrax's hands, it's just that they weren't connected to the rest of him. Then she cut off the rest of his limbs and presented the body to Astrubial Vect. It's still howling in pain above the gates of his palace. Oddly enough, she seems to lack the ambition and sadism of most Dark Elder, similar to Draza. She knows she's the best in the arenas, and has proven it for about as long as Europe has been a thing, but she doesn't seek political power beyond leading the witch cult of strife. She simply shows up before a raid with some of her backup dancers blood brides at the domain of the Ark and she's choosing to work with a rare occasion she's often in such high demand that bids for. Her services have triggered cabal wars, does her thing with her blood brides, and takes home interesting trophies from fallen opponents that she houses in a private museum. She's not only a gladiatrix, a noble woman, and a porn star, she's a curator. She probably catalogues that shit in a little tweed jacket late at night when nobody's looking. She's still a mass murderer and bloody minded warrior, but that's par for the course in 40k, so it's hard not to view her as less of monster than most dark elder, and just a natural born killer. Lilith is known as a woman of very few words not as few as Drazha, still whose preferred method of communication is through violence. She is said to have an unexpectedly cute voice though, which she may not be proud of. She also manages the Crucible Psy. Is Vec just wandering around Kamerag naming things after himself? Actually never mind. That sounds like classic him. The greatest arena in the universe, with Reaver arenas the size of cities and a coliseum carved of living jade. Vect has commented that this grandeur is appropriate, for Lilith Hesperax is the greatest treasure of the Dark City, and one does not display one's finest emerald amid squalor, DOI or. That's adorable Vect. She and a good number of other Dark Elder decided to ditch Kamerag and left to join Evrain's new inner Elder faction. If Rain thinks Lilith's reason for helping her out is simply that she likes the idea of breaking Slanesh's hold on the Elder so she can bask in the adoration of her fans in the arena for millennia, to come without the need to keep her soul topped up. Then again, Lilith did kill her earlier that day so she could just be grumbling about that. The new codex reveals that, while it's unknown whether or not she turned over a new leaf, Lilith desires to capture Lucius the Eternal and duel him to the death. 
Lilith knows about his knack of possessing his killer, but she thinks the ability is tied to his armor, which he plans to remove before dueling him. Other lore also implies that possessing his killer won't work in the web way, which happens to be HQ for Dark Elder. There is a possibility that she has dated a particular farseer, but this is just an unsubstantiated rumor that Lilith will flay people alive for spreading. And don't even think about mentioning the allegations of the monkey fuckbody she's taken a shine to unless you want to see what your guts look like on the outside of your body. Perhaps most importantly, Lofn thinks Auntie Lilith is really cool. Woe and numerous stab wounds be to anyone who reminds her of how much she adores her niece. If TG is to be believed, she also has a daughter. On tabletop. Unfortunately, despite the very solid fluff behind it, her model doesn't see as much use as it could. Lilith only has a mediocre strength of 3 and lacks access to combat drugs Lely is straight edge. Not even once. You guys the only way to up her strength is with the furious charge granted by power from pain. She's a whirlwind of attacks, but she lacks the punch to turn those into wounds. 7 fed, threw her a bone and gave her a roll fail to wound rolls which is nice, but still not enough to reliably take on enemy characters. However, she is great against tarpits of strength 3 troops, and is fucking hilarious against TAU. She used to gain X attacks, where X is the difference between her insane weapon skill of 9 and the highest WS value amongst her opponents, but now she just has Rampage. She also has a hilariously high ballistic skill, also 9, despite having no ranged weapons until the 6th edition grenade update. You can just imagine an Arkan begging her to at least carry a blaster, but bitch stuck up. We're getting real tired of yo shit, Hesperax. Her WS spikes to 10 if she's your warlord. 8th edition is out now and Games Workshop decided to return mix up everything that made her special. Her brief experimentation with drugs in the meter is over. Lilith is straight edge again. She got a nice buff to her movement range, her invuln save is up to a 3, and she buffs up all nearby witch cult of strife models, which can include any reaver jet bikes, hellions, beast masters, and witches. The CS Gota version. A second Lilith Hesperax exists in the book Warrior Aspect by CS Gotu, a slanish worshipping sicker overlord and undling murdering idiot who dwells in the Eye of Terror. This is so totally irreconcilable with all Dark Elder lore in general and with the Lilith Hesperax described above even going by her slimmer 3rd edition fluff in particular. That we have to mark this up to an imposter. A coincidental name similarity Lilith Hesperax is probably the Dark Elder equivalent of David Smith. Or the madness of the Black Irish Leper. More like succubus of the cult of Waifu. Am I right? <laughs> Heresy. Urian Rakath. You better start running. You should be grateful. Once I remove your skin, you will feel so much cooler. And when I'm done with you, you shall serve a greater purpose. Urian Rakath to a random captive space marine he was experimenting on in the 3rd edition Dark Elder Codex. The thing known as Urian Rakath is truly one of the sickest freaks within the 41st millennium and we are talking the grim darkness of the far future, where sick fucks like Fabulous Bile, Slanesh, and Mad Skeleton Robot Spider Scientists exist. He is one of the homunculi, those fun-loving Dark Elder who enjoy nothing more than exploring up to and beyond the limits of your pain threshold. Just for the sake of it and their own perverted amusement curiosity boredom. Urien is amongst the oldest of his brethren and a genius in his field, regardless of if this field were torture, flesh sculpting or anatomical body mutilation. The fact that he is a genius, but has hardly ever produced anything of note, says worrying things about the skills of the homunculi. He no longer cares about the Dark Elder's politics, he just wants to be as depraved as possible now. He is utterly mad, often wandering around his laboratories gibbering crazily to himself about finding more experiments, sometimes even while already torturing someone. In one White Dwarf battle report after a Dark Elder victory over Craft World Elder, there's a piece of fluff where Urian's thrilled at the chance to eat a Farseer's bones because he likes the taste and eating them can grant visions. So not only is he the only canon example of an elder cannibal souls may not count, it's because he will eat other elder. He's one of the few dark elder who'll violate one of Kamorag's very few laws. How black a soul is he? He laughs at all the examples of horror movies mankind makes. He shakes his head with paternal tolerance at the idea of a human centipede, simply asks if that is all, and suggests further ways to add to it. Anything taboo he yawns at and says been there, done that. There are Dark Elder and then there is Urian Rakath. 
he has been reborn into new bodies countless times and actually now comes to relish the feeling of dying each time. Just another experience to the crazed scientist. However, something has gone wrong in his reincarnating process, or it could be his utterly twisted soul is now affecting his physical form. But he is now as much of a monster in body as he is in mind and spirit. His spine is a twisting compound wreck that leaves his posture constantly sloping, and he has multiple limbs, some decaying or dead, poking out of every angle of his back. His face itself is now held onto his skull with pieces of leathery flesh. In a way he now resembles a puppet, his broken and yet functioning body moving at his commands despite it not being possible in any realistic way. Despite his madness he is still as expert in his craft as ever, able to create constructs that outshine his fellows, and he's considered arguably the most skilled of Dark Elder Hemonculi. The law heavily implies he is the one who came up with the Dark Elder's ability to physically regenerate by feeding on suffering. And if even a single one of Rakath's bones is found right down to a single digit bone from one of his vestigial hands, he can regenerate from that. His uber grotesques are stronger, tougher, and, although it makes no sense considering what he must do to them, are saner and more able to follow commands. It is no surprise then he is still regarded as the most senior of the Hemonculi masters, and still leads his own coven, the Prophets of Flesh. It is believed Slanish is desperately trying to scout out his talent for a position at his palace as head torturer plastic surgeon to the demonettes. So far Yurian has declined these most generous offers but like with all elder, Slanesh will eventually get his her its man. Assuming Yurian is ever going to die for good, which we may safely bet would never happen though the Imperium may have one way of doing it. Before the gathering storm he orchestrated a series of raids to capture millions of people and put them in stasis so he can take torture and feed off people if anything bad happens in the Dark Elder. Can't do raids anymore. Since the stirring of inner Durian has, like all the Hemonculi, made clear their opposition and fear of this new god and its followers, and remains firmly aligned to Astrubial Vect in Kamorag, opposing any sort of cooperation or alliance with the innery whilst, simultaneously, being interested in their abilities to cheat death. He also planned to try and take control of the Incarn to get complete mastery over death. When Vect was killed, Urian provided one of his finest performances for the funeral. However, at the height of it, he had his creation slaughter all the other Argons, and their combined suffering rejuvenated Vect and brought him back to life. Urian Rakath proceeded to resurrect every Archon there. The Archons loyal to Vect were brought back as they were while the disloyal ones were turned into monsters subservient to Vect. Like most Dark Elder characters he's done very little of note. So I'm sure some of you guys know me well enough that I'm a Dark Elder player myself and uh, whenever I saw a load of people comment and said, oh Dvac next Dvac, how could I say no to that? You know, I just love Dark Elder. So like, you know, of course I was going to do it and like, you know, I'm not going to just Dvac now. I'm going to do all the major players in the Dark City, you know. Um, I, I, there's something about Kamor. It just it, the whole city. It reminds me of the fall of Rome so heavily. Like you know the the backstabbing and the political intrigue and all that stuff. I just fucking love. I just love it. And uh, like you know, don't get me wrong. Dark Elder aren't as fleshed out as well as other like you know races or factions or whatever. But what they do have is fucking amazing. I love it. You know what I mean? So pff, you know. I think if I if I'm really into something, I'm sure you guys are really into it too. And you know, it's something that not everyone is familiar with. You know what I mean? But no. Um, if you're wondering what these pictures are, these are a few of my own uh, Dark Elder HQ conversions. I started playing 40k again at the end of sixth edition. So I never really got to play with the HQs properly, and it was really sad whenever the 7th edition rulebook came out and we lost them all. But it doesn't mean I can't, like, you know, sometimes, like, you know, use the Archon's goals and use someone else. And, you know, I, I, I really enjoy converting. Um, I've, ma I've made a video a long time ago about my Dark Elder conversion, so I'll link to that one down below if you're interested in anything that you see here. I think they're... I, I really enjoy them, although... They are a wee bit dusty, sadly. I know, uh, I don't get to play 40k as much as what I used to or what I would like to do, you know. But, uh, no, I won't talk about them too much here because otherwise I'll go off the arc. So if you're interested in this stuff, definitely check the links down below and check out that video for all. It, 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 it explains all the conversions and where bits I got where and, you know, it's a lot of fun. But hey, also, if you like the music that I used in this video, um, I started a 24-7 Synthwave radio channel. 
Um, so if you're into this type of music, which, you know, I am, I, I don't know, I, I think, like, you know, Synth Leaf kind of works well with Dark Elder, especially the old Dark Elder aesthetic, like, you know, that whole 80s vibe, I don't know, there's something about it, I, I thought it really worked really well, but, um, no, if you're into Synth Leaf at all, definitely check that out as well, um, links as well down below, but hey, um, like, you know, comment who you think I should cover you next time for Monday for a chan. Like, you know, Monday for a chan is such a good site. I can't, I can't really explain to you how much I love Monday for a chan. Like, you know, um, I would say this is more me paying homage <laughs> to the website. I think it's great. Um, honestly, if it wasn't for it, I don't think I'd be back into 40k just because I love the way that it's written and it feels like, you know, you're talking to like your friend almost about 40k. It feels like it doesn't feel like a lore book or a lore articles. It's, you know, it's not over the top serious. Like, you know, it feels like you can have fun and like, you know, that's one of the big things I think about the 40k universe. It is. It's a really fun universe to like delve in into. So I really recommend 1D4 channel as well. Um, go on do it click the links, just work away, and you could get lost for hours and hours on end. It's such a good 40k website. I'd say it's probably one of the best, bar, like, you know, maybe um, traditional gaming, to be honest with you, like, you know. But, hey, um, also, <laughs> I keep saying also, this is going for, this is one of the longer items, because I've got so much to talk about, but, hey, um, also, um, who do you want to see next time? Uh, comment down below. The person with the most amount of likes will be the winner. And I'll cover them next time. Probably sometime next week. Um, pff, I think it'll be a lot of fun. Like, you know, there's so many, like, you know, obscure characters out there. And I'll probably do the same as what I did. We'll do other leading characters to them. Or somewhere in the same vein as them. You know, to try and get the most out of them. You know, because I don't want to just do, like, wee tiny, tiny videos. I want to, like, whenever I do a video, I like to cover it. You know what I mean? I really want to try and cover it as best I can. So, like... Um, as I say, comment down below. Look, I suppose I'll talk. Stop talking now, won't I? Um, look, I'll see you in the next video. Hope you've enjoyed. Uh, click that notification bell, and I'll see you soon. If you haven't already, check out my Redbubble portfolio. You might just find something you like. This, this is, is not okay. This needs to stop now. This is cancer. This, this is so much cancer that I can feel the tumors growing on my back and it's way down heavy on me and it's not okay can you help a nigga out and just stop this please